morning, everybody. Thank you for co coming along to this Science Slam, which is the road to scalability and access for IPS-derived therapies. Um, we've got a, a really good panel, um, and there's going to be a series of 10-minute talks, and then there'll be a 30-minute panel after that. So obviously, to treat high prevalent diseases, we need to be able to produce large quantities of drug product at scale and at low cost. Um, and one of the avenues where we may get there is with the use of um, IPS-derived drug product. Um, so first, to investigate that in this panel, we've, we'd like to open up some questions after the talks to yourselves as well. But we want to look at how close are we to achieving this low-cost production for high-prevalent diseases. So at scale and then the access for patients for these. So as I say, there'll be a series of talks. Each of the panel members after Jennifer will introduce themselves and then we'll, we'll move into the panel uh, session. So the first speaker up is Jennifer Dashnow, for, who is the VP of Analytical Development and Quality Control at Century Therapeutics. Good morning, everybody. Um, as she said, I am Jennifer Dashna. I'm with Century Therapeutics, where our focus is on genetically engineered iPSC-derived NK and T cell therapies. Our products uh, undergo a series of edits, upwards of six to eight uh, modifications to the genome in order to confer them with the characteristics that are needed for an allogeneic off-the-shelf therapy. As a result, uh, genome safety assessment is an important aspect of our release and our characterization strategy. In March 2022, the FDA issued uh, genome editing draft guidance, which provides us with a starting point for genome safety assessments. Contained within this document, they have recommendations on both the testing of genetic engineering components, as well as extensive drug product testing, which could, uh, if you were to do this testing on a batch-by-batch -batch basis, uh, lead to additional time and cost associated with release of the batch. This, these recommendations reflect the agency's experience with earlier generation therapies, both in vivo gene therapies, as well as ex vivo autologous and donor-derived cell therapies. But when we look at the processes used for iPSC-based uh, cell therapies, there are significant differences, which lead us to, to questioning whether these uh, recommendations would fully apply to our type of therapy. IPSC-derived processes present a different risk profile than both the autologous and the donor-derived allogeneics. IPSC-derived processes start with a healthy donor, and from that healthy donor, we select our targeted cell type, and those cells undergo reprogramming and genetic editing in order to introduce all of the modifications needed to the genome. This leads to uh, a bulk pool of cells uh, that we can take forward further into cell line development. These processes done early, the reprogramming, the gene editing, are done once per the product lifetime. So this eliminates donor variability and critical component variability. After we have these, this bulk edited population, we undergo single cell cloning. Cloning um, post-editing eliminates any variability that we have from the gene editing process. Further, that single cell clone is then uh, expanded in order to create a master cell bank, which serves as the starting point for each, uh, each batch manufacturer. That MCB is, has the ability to be well characterized, and we can perform much of the testing that would be recommended on the drug product at that upstream stage of the MCB. So what does a different approach look like then for uh, an iPSC-derived process? Well, one example is with our residual uh, genome editing component strategy. So here we've leveraged principles that are present in ICHQ5A in order to essentially validate out the need for testing a number of these GE components. We perform um, a set of clearance studies for our gene editing platform, which is largely consistent from one product to the next, in order to support not having to do this testing for any given product. 
we have uh, three different components in our process, plasmids, guide RNAs, and uh, nuclease. And so we need to understand the starting concentrations that we're using in genome editing. That represents our theoretical maximum level of GE component that will be present in the system. We need to understand the mechanisms of clearance, and that can happen through both media exchanges um, as well as then cell doubling. And we need to understand the stability of these components. We've performed uh, theoretical calculations in order to look at the extent to which these components will be present after media replacement and after uh, doubling of our cells, and have identified that within about five media exchanges or about 15 days in culture, the levels of these components are reduced below that which would be able to be detected by any of our analytical methods. We've studied the stability of these components in model systems and have shown that for at least two of the components, the stability is very short-lived, um, not exceeding really more than a week. Um, and it's only the plasmid um, that has a stability around 50 days that may represent a potential concern. We've also then evaluated the, the presence of uh, these components in our actual process and have demonstrated that they get to levels that are not detectable um, before about eight days um, in, in the process. And so with this, we've developed a package which can support the need not to test for guide RNA and for our nuclease, and we really just focus on testing for the plasmid at our MCB. We also do our on and off target assessments as well as chromosomal rearrangement assessments at the MCB stage instead of the drug product. As I mentioned earlier, we uh, utilize a, a strategy of single cell cloning as an important part of our overall control strategy. This allows us to reduce the risks associated with genome editing by giving us a homogeneous population it eliminates the chance that we have a low frequency variant that might clonally um, expand over the duration of our manufacturing process, and it eliminates the concerns around our genome editing process variability. It also gives us the ability to test at our master cell bank as a representative matrix, and it gives us a chance to use less sensitive methods than what's uh, typically recommended. So instead of doing a guide seek approach plus targeted NGS, we use a more direct measure of targeted locus amplification. Just to give you a feel for what this looks like in our process, so here this is an example showing transgene copy number by DDPCR. It's looking throughout our process as we go from master cell bank to drug product. It's showing uh, results for a number of different batches of intermediate and drug product, as well as a number of transgenes that have been introduced. And the common theme across all of that is that whether it's a biallelic insert or a monoallelic insert, we're seeing very consistent transgene copy copy levels across the process and across batches. An example of our targeted locus amplification plot, this is for a single edit uh, cell. Uh, what we're showing here circled in green is that we have the appropriate uh, on-target integration of that transgene, and you don't see any additional peaks across the genome, and that's giving us assurance that we have no off-target integrations detected in this specific example. Uh, so across those two previous uh, examples of how we're approaching our, our control strategy, uh, a common theme is that we're moving testing forward up to the MCB stage. So for our product type, we are only producing one master cell bank. We will never remake that MCB that's going to exist for the full lifetime of the product. And this means that this testing is done only once as opposed to on each drug product batch. So this table is really giving you a feel for how we characterize for genome safety across the uh, cell line development. Um, so cell line development is starting at the donor and going through to the development of our pre-master cell bank, which is our cell substrate, as well as what we do during the actual manufacturing process, uh, which consists of the MCB, HPC, and drug product. Um, while I've spoken to the residual genome editing component uh, strategy as well as how we address other editing related attributes, what you will notice is that there is some testing that we still perform on the drug product. And this is to address residual risk that's not necessarily related to our genome editing, but is related to the extensive expansion that we do post MCB during our manufacture. 
Um, so here what we're doing is we're monitoring for the accumulation of variants that may happen as you have the cells undergo additional doublings. And this is looking for small variants, structural, and copy number variants. And what we're doing is during the uh, development process, we're monitoring these attributes in order to understand our risk so that we can build enough confidence and process understanding that by registration, we can make a case to significantly reduce the amount of additional testing that we would do on, deep, on the drug product for uh, the accumulation of variants. And so with that, um, what I'll do is wrap up with just some recommendations when we think about how we handle genome care, uh, control strategy based on some of the regulatory interactions that we've had to date. And what I really want to stress is that the regulatory guidance that we have is really a starting point. What we're doing is cutting edge. There isn't necessarily uh, a paradigm, and our product and process don't fit neatly into a box. And so you have to you know, take a slightly different approach, which, which considers the process um, that you're performing. Risk assessments can be very helpful in justifying alternative approaches. And you should engage the agency early and often in order to align on that approach and make sure that there's a common understanding of what you're attempting to do. And finally, transparency is key. Um, err on the side of over-communication. We are both learning, agencies and sponsors, and providing that more detailed information enables a more meaningful scientific dialogue that will ultimately lead to uh, more flexible outcomes for, for the sponsor. And so with that, I will wrap up and hand over to our next speaker. My name is uh, Stefan Brown, founder and CTO of Solistic. I'm a stem cell biologist by training with over 20 years of experience with embryonic stem cells and iPS cells. Um, so thanks, Jennifer, for the great introduction about uh, cell line development. I just wanted to, to take one step back um, and, and talk a little bit about why we are so excited about iPSC technology to make allogeneic cell therapies. And this really goes back to, to the scalability as was introduced. So I think the fundamental concern that we are seeing as a field with donor-derived allogeneic is that the cells start to exhaust at a certain point. So you will always need multiple donors that lead to comparability challenges, both in preclinical development and in clinical development. The difference with iPSC is that you actually can expand at multiple stages. So you can expand at the iPSC stage, you can expand at the HSC stage, at the lymphoid progenitor, so uh, at, at any progenitor, it doesn't really matter about the lineage. So, so your expansion potential is enormous and, and that actually justifies the paradigm that Jennifer was talking about, one master cell bank for the lifetime of the product. Uh, as Jennifer also mentioned, uh, in terms of gene editing, what, what, what is maybe needed, uh, and, and that is seen in, 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 in Sentry's pipeline and other pipelines, is that we, that we need quite sophisticated editing strategies to, to build that product that is really effective. Uh, you, you probably cannot do that in a donor-derived allogeneic. If you want to do those six edits, uh, that, that process actually gets crazy. Well, if you do that, um, as Jennifer said, um, once in, in, uh, at the IPSC stage, then you actually have that a possibility to do so. Um, so the manufacturing flow, um, it's, it's, a similar, it's a similar concept, uh, different colors and, and a different line. So what, what, what we are doing as a field, we, we are making iPSCs, we are bringing these edits into the cell, creating a working cell bank and a master cell bank, and that really becomes the starting point for the manufacturing process. And so what, what I wanted to highlight here is that this is actually fundamentally different than, than a manufacturing process for an autologous cell therapy. In fact, if you think about it, it's, it's a lot more similar to biologics. Uh, where, where you make a producer cell line and where you go into a manufacturing process, in that case to make, a, to make an antibody or a biologic, here the cell is actually the key, uh, the, 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 the key deliverable. 
I think the fundamental difference here is that, that the differentiation process is, is quite complex. Th this is the most complex biology uh, on Earth. You're starting with a pluripotent stem cell that, that can become everything. So controlling that biology, making sure that you reproducibly make the same cells over and over again is, is a very, very critical piece during your manufacturing process development. So uh, we, we have three germ layers, ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm. And so what you actually see is that the lineage decision is made very, very early. So the, the first hours of a differentiation process can actually make or break uh, the, the efficiency of such a process. So what we do as a field, and, and I think this is why it's taken a while since we are standing here, uh, is, is, is really understanding developmental signals. Um, and, and recapitulate those signals in a cell culture. Uh, what you see in an embryo is that you have temporal and spatial gradients, and those are driving the lineage decisions. So the moment that you understand those, you actually know how you can drive a cell towards ectoderm, to endoderm, to mesoderm, and specialize them further to the cell type that you want to make. So in terms of a manufacturing process, th this now gets a little bit more complex than average because you have different steps driving the cell in that lineage tree. And typically what you do is use different media compositions, maybe even different manufacturing technologies and bioreactors uh, to, to, to be appropriate for the cell type that you are, that you are making. Keep in mind a pluripotent cell is, is, actually, um, is actually an epithelial-like cell, wants to sit together with its other cell types. If you make a T cell at the end, that's a fundamentally different cell, so you might actually use a different manufacturing strategy. Um, so what you then also see is that there are lots of technologies coming together in that manufacturing process. There, there are gene edits, like the, the cars, the TCRs, uh, anything that you want to do on safety switches, on alloy evasion, maybe tumor microenvironment uh, modulation, uh, which, which together with the differentiation process at the end of the day drives the product uh, critical quality attributes. So it's, it's quite fundamental that, that you start to lock parts of that process as early as possible because that process is still driving the outcome and still driving those CQAs. So the goals of manufacturing process development are, are to drive towards those CQAs. Uh, what is very important is that, that you're using materials that are well controlled. So I think the, the, one of the big ironies is that, that this field started to use chemically defined media before other cell therapy fields were even thinking about it. So the last time that I pipetted serum was like 15 years ago. And, and so it, th that's just an ingredient that, that, that doesn't work in, in a manufacturing process like this. So, so what you really want to understand are what are the critical process parameters? How are those critical process parameters driving CQAs, uh, and, and what you want to do is, because we are working with quite long manufacturing processes, is to measure it over time to really understand what you're doing so that you can also correct and optimize. Um, so in terms of manufacturing technology, um, so one of the key things that, that we learned over working with, with 20 plus different cell types is that selecting manufacturing technology early is really, really important. So one example on cardiomyocytes, uh, you might have a perfect process in a six well stage. The moment that you put it in a T25, probably doesn't work anymore. The moment that you put it in a multi-stack, it probably doesn't work anymore. So it's, it's very sensitive to, to, to the environment that the cells are being cultured in. And so what we have been doing uh, the last eight years is to actually very, very early on go to stir tank bioreactors, where we actually see that, that the technology limit that, that you hit with, with, with something like a, like a dish doesn't really exist, at least in, 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 in the 1 million to, to 10 to 50 billion cells. That's kind of the space that, that we are typically exploring. And so it might be there if you're going to scale to a 2,000 liter reactor, but, but that, that's, I think, right now um, a little bit far away from most therapeutic developers. 
So uh, key things that you want to look at uh, building such a manufacturing process are, are controlling the inputs, uh, such as the cytokines, the media compositions, uh, all the physical parameters, such as oxygen, pH, um, agitation, aeration, uh, the density of inoculation, uh, passage number uh, for genome safety reasons, and feeding schedules to drive towards the right cell with the right yield, with the right identity, and the phenotype and potency. So um, manufacturing process development deals with successful scale-up, reduced cost of goods, and improved qual product quality. So what we typically see is that uh, the, the majority of, of, um, of cell therapy products right now still are autologous. Uh, that, that it's a, a large effort for, for therapeutic developers to learn all the IPS technologies on top of that. And so the reason that we build Solistic is to, to build manufacturing processes to make them accessible for therapeutic developers where we actually co-develop therapies and, and bring them to the clinic. So what we have built is a cell line development platform where product-specific features get introduced into the IPSC, where we manufacture the master cell bank, and uh, we, we have manufacturing platforms for, for the differentiation towards rock product, working on NK cells, uh, T cells, and macrophages. And with that, uh, I hand it over to the next speaker. Yes, thank you, Stefan. And first of all, thanks for the, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. I'm Salka Rasmussen. I'm a vice president at Novo Nordisk, and I head our cell therapy and uh, partnerships and early innovation area uh, here at, uh, at Novo Nordisk. Uh, you've already heard uh, from the previous speakers uh, about the complexity of making uh, a living drug into a uh, cell therapy. And we often use this slide when we are going to speak about what we are doing in the cell therapy R&D. Uh, so making a small molecule into a drug, we have probably all done that at some point in our career. Uh, that is super complex, but when you then move into biologics and, and proteins, then that becomes even more complex. Uh, and then taking it to the next level, that is like going to the space um, and making a living drug uh, as we are doing here with the cell therapy uh, field. That is really, really the next level of co complexity. So at Novo Nordisk, we also try to address a lot of the uh, complexities and issues that we have heard the two previous speakers uh, speaking to, and uh, here we have the whole value chain built to, to take care of these um, issues and challenges. And it is very important, and that is what I would like to address today, that you early on focus on uh, the issues you will face further down the road when you are not only going into first in man, but actually are trying to move beyond that and going into um, the market. In the cell therapy R&D, uh, at Novo Nordisk, we are about 300 employees now, and we have uh, three front-runner programs. Uh, we are in clinic now with our partners in chronic heart failure, in Parkinson's disease, and, and we're moving forward with our type 1 diabetes program. Um, we do a lot of partnerships, and that's also why we are uh, very happy to be here today. Uh, we work with a lot of uh, external partnerships, uh, both in academia, biotech, and also actually other pharma companies. Uh, so, and, and that we value a lot, and also CROs and CDMOs, uh, because the complexity in this space really cater for uh, external um, input from technology sites and, and also in the disease indications that we work in. We are building out uh, our units. Uh, we have the research and CMC in uh, Denmark, north of Copenhagen, where most of our uh, unit is based. And we can tap into the bigger Novo Nordisk uh, R&D uh, space. And that is very helpful when you need to uh, work with these novel technologies. And there is actually a lot you can still learn from, from you can say, the old way of doing drug, drug development. Then we have a site uh, here in California 
California in uh, Fremont, um, where we do our uh, early manufacturing. And then we are building out in New Hampshire, uh, US, uh, our site for uh, product supply uh, for the latest, later stages. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, three front-runner programs, uh, Parkinson's disease and chronic heart failure and then type 1 diabetes. Um, and I'll just touch upon what we have worked with in the Parkinson's disease space. Uh, we have our partnership with the Lund University and also Cambridge uh, University uh, with Roger Barger and, and Marlene Palmer and, and Anders Bjørklund from the Lund University. And together with our partners, we have now brought this forward into uh, the clinic in the first and main trial. And the first patients uh, were dosed earlier this year, and we look very much forward to the outcome of, of this trial. Um, but it's clear once you have made it all the way to patients, that's a huge accomplishment. And as many of you know, that is, uh, there's a lot of hurdles you need to overcome. But uh, then, actually, this, the challenges really start. Then you have to look at all the things you're doing. Do you have the right uh, models in place? Do you have your potency assay? Do you have the right raw materials in your process? Do you have the right scale? Can you continue to your phase two? Can you continue to even market with the product you have at hand? Or is there stuff you should have done differently? And I think that is where the maturity of this space needs to come, uh, that we have to uh, be better at looking ahead in due time and make the right decisions because as you, as you also heard from Jennifer and, and Stefan earlier, if you make the wrong decisions, then you might not be able to use your cell line, you might not be able to use the scale, scale or the manufacturing process that you are working with. Uh, adherent cells might not be the right choice, you might have to go to bioreactors. And that is uh, what we are also working with and learning as we move ahead. And I think that is the maturity of the whole field uh, we're looking into. So this is a simpler cartoon, and, and I think uh, what we all in this field should start looking more into is exactly as we're discussing today, how do we uh, do the scale up, how do we work with our uh, drug substance, and more also very importantly, what device are we going to use to uh, transplant the cells into the patient, how do we formulate the cells? And, and these two things is also something you need to be aware of when you also want to scale towards the market. Uh, is your device scalable? Is that manufactured in the right way? And so on. And if you then add on, as Jennifer alluded to earlier, uh, the genome editing, that means a lot of things actually have to be done right on your cell line. And maybe that is years back. Uh, so if you start doing genome editing, it's, it's very wise to do it right, as Jennifer also alluded to, uh, to make sure that that cell line can actually go all the way, because it is a, a, a rough choice to have to go all the way back and redo stuff. Uh, I'll touch upon these uh, four uh, topics and, and dive into the raw material part, because these are also what we have faced and, and learned. The, the things you should really uh, look into once you do your process and once you move forward beyond phase one. You need to have your analytical package really well thought through and well established. Your raw materials, they cannot be redone, especially those on the cell lines. Uh, and parts of the process will also be very difficult to redo because you might, your cell product might change if you change too much on the both raw material and the process. Uh, and how do you make sure that your process is ready for uh, clinical supplies? So on the raw material side, it is, uh, we here compare it to the biologics. And the biologics is easier, of course, because there you can put in barriers in the end before you have your final drug product. Uh, so you could do filtration before you do your filling or other types of barriers. So of course the raw materials matters, but not to the same extent as we face here in the cell therapy uh, field, because the cell you start out with and the raw materials that that cell, that exact cell has been uh, touching is actually the same cell that you many years later will 
uh, dose to the, your patients. And that really means that you have to think carefully about how do you pick your raw materials? Are they okay from a regulatory point of view? Uh, can you uh, do put in the right barriers? If you can't change to a GMP raw materials, what do you then do before you introduce them into your process? And that is considerations that I think is very, very important. Uh, for the whole field to start uh, maturing and, and think about this very early on. So uh, to reach the market fast, uh, a lot of steps have to be done right. Uh, actually, all of these steps here uh, you have to do right if you want to continue directly to the market, uh, and that is uh, our experience uh, during the years, and I think a learning in the whole field, and that is what we uh, all could, uh, could help each other out and where our technologies will mature to make sure we have uh, closed, uh, closed systems for manufacturing that would ease up a lot. How do you handle your clinical supply in a good way so you avoid the need for GMP facilities at the uh, place where the patients are, are transplanted with your uh, drug product and so on. So there's a lot of stuff that still needs to be developed and matured in this field, but I think we are certainly uh, getting there. Uh, yeah, and I will close up with those words. Thank you. <laughs> very much. Um, really interesting talks and I, I'll take any questions from the, if anybody wants to ask a question at any point I'll just keep on looking out, oh there is a question there and then we'll go to the panel. There's a mic. Um, there's a lot of uh, work on the gene editing that, that was great work, you talked about six to eight gene edits. Uh, as you know, in pluripotent stem cells, there's issues with uh, genetic integrity, but, but maybe at a, at a single nucleotide level. What about next-gen sequencing-based methods to analyze the master cell bank, oncopanel type uh, things, whole exome sequencing that maybe in regulatory region or something, is the agency interested in knowing that or not yet? Um, it's too much information. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that they would say that that's too much information. Um, so that uh, you do hit on a good point. Um, you know, there's there's many considerations um, even early on when you're selecting your donor. What genetic background are they coming in with? Um, when you go through and you reprogram, there are known um, CNB hotspots and other potential single nucleotide variants that um, could potentially be an issue associated with reprogramming. And obviously, there's the genome editing risks. So um, you know, if you remember Remember back to that slide with the table that um, showed our strategy. Um, embedded in there is that concept of doing testing very early on, um, even all the way back to the donor and throughout your process in order to understand what is present at different stages and to be able to uh, develop a risk assessment and understand as a company, what are you comfortable taking forward? Um, what do you think presents a potential risk based on the type of therapy that you're developing and maybe what that risk benefit uh, ratio might look like for the intended patient population and ultimately um, be able to have those discussions early on so that you're comfortable bringing forward that um, potential master cell bank and eventual product before you get too far along in development and are really locked into that um, specific cell line. So I would encourage, you know, there's a multitude of methods that you can uh, use to look, um, you know, deeply into uh, different aspects of the genome. And I would encourage, um, you know, sponsors to consider um, how that then plays into your risk assessment strategy. Anything else? And I suppose, the, the, the age-old thing is if you don't know what the results mean, then your interaction with the agency, you have to be very careful. Yeah. So you, you asked about and, whether you should. And so the, uh, that, that is the problem. So uh, our, our DNA replication is not perfect. So with, with every cell division, there are approximately three nucleotide changes somewhere in the genome. 
And so you're culturing cells in any manufacturing process. And so you will hit at some point at, at variants of unknown significance. And so that is a, it's a risk-based approach, what, what you want to measure, what you don't want to measure, and, and where you feel comfortable with. Yeah, and it's not just what you're measuring, but then um, how are you filtering or what are you going to do with that information? So if you were to look just at um, you know, small variants, you will absolutely find on the order of you know four to five million mm. variants. What are you going to do with that information? So you have to be able to narrow that down and to apply some sort of risk filter to understand what the potential significance is of those findings. And then you know have a discussion around maybe what those higher risk um, potential higher risk variants might mean for your development. So Wait, there's another question there. Quick question on um, IPSC manufacturing. Since the IPSC is an intermediate product, does the panel have a view in manufacturing GMP versus GMP-like? Did you hear that? Yeah. Sorry, could you, I didn't quite hear it. Could you so uh, since the IPSC is an intermediate product, so you can manufacture in GMP, or in a GMP-like setting. Okay. So does the panel have a view on which, which is a proper direction because it is an intermediate product and it is gonna go through a variety of QC and dilution before it goes to a final product? Sure, okay. So, so. so I think the consensus in the field is that you, you have to make the master cell bank in, in a full-blown GMP environment with quality oversight, adhering to all the GMP rules. Upstream of that, the, the, the gene editing and, and the reprogramming, a lot of companies, including ours, are doing that in a GMP-like setting where we apply GMP principles but do, do not use all the stringency of GMP. So it, it's, we consider that a phase-appropriate approach and uh, our understanding is that the field is moving in this direction. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you know, we consider that part of our cell line development process, and we focus our, um, you know, the GMP principles that we select to apply are not full GMP, um, but really it's it's um, focused on understanding the provenance of those cells, um, what potential risks that you might be introducing from a viral or microbial safety perspective, um, and and you know, really it's a more limited focus on the GMP aspects. It's not full GMP until you get to that fully edited. Uh, master cell bank. Yeah, I very much agree, but uh, we also at Novo Nordisk try to be think years ahead because we have also seen that the bar is rising, right? So the product you probably work on today will, the authorities will look different on the uh, regulations in, in the, the coming years, right? So it is also maybe to try to think ahead what will be the next level of, of GMP compliance and, and we try to address that on top uh, of what is required today. Can I, can I, can you pass this down please? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Great, pre pre great presentations, all of you. Uh, just a couple of questions. First question probably to Jennifer about, um, so you mentioned um, you as a company collecting all this data, right, to have a package to be submitted to FDA or uh, European authorities eventually to support commercial production. Um, do you think how we how we as an industry can approach that in terms of not dealing with this separate, like each company dealing with it separately, but just to combine some knowledge and actually approach FDA with this, that we actually need a guidance on IPSC, right? And this genome editing guidance is not gonna help us. It's just very small guidance, very small part on CMC. And it's not, it's a lot, actually created more questions than actually answer it, right? So that's one question. So how we would approach that in terms of kind of pushing, you know, authorities to create a guidance for us based on the current uh, sponsor, sponsors, uh, information coming from different sponsors on IPSC field. And another question about uh, MCB, WCB, two-tier system, how, how would you, do you think we have to think about this two-tier system from the beginning or it's, uh, actually um, applicable for IPSC that we only have master cell bank. We do not create WCB at all for commercial product. 
So to tackle the first question, that's very timely. Um, so I will give a plug, um, <laughs> at least in terms of the conversations that we're having with the U.S. agency, with the FDA, um, there is uh, exploration of a new platform designation. And one of the platforms, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're proposing are IPSCs. And so there, that's an opportunity. If, um, if the FDA is receptive to that, that case study, that's an opportunity for us to get together across industry and propose, you know, what does a standard approach look like for iPSC-derived therapies? And to align on some of those considerations um, and, and potentially influence um, how the agency uh, is looking at this uh, class of therapies. Uh, with respect to the second question, around uh, MCB versus working cell banks, um, you know, I think that that depends on what your projected use of those master cell banks are going to be over the life of the product. You do not need to introduce a two-tiered strategy, and you can come in at a later point and introduce a second tier if it's required. You just have to think ahead towards what's going to be needed in order to qualify that new working cell bank um, compared back to the original master cell bank. And there is an existing biotech guidance, um, ICHQ5D, I believe, that that gets into some of the considerations that you'll need to take into account if you decide to do a one-tier versus two-tier system. And on top of that, I think it greatly um, depends on the cell type that you're manufacturing and the expansion that you can get in the manufacturing process. So to give a, a bad, ex well, a difficult example, there, there are studies that cite that in, in type 1 diabetes islet that, that the input iPSC to islet is, is almost one-to-one. Uh, in, in, in T cells and K cells, you can get 10,000 of false expansion. So that looks like a, a fully different, different manufacturing process. I can't see any other questions. So picking up on something you've all, picked, all mentioned is that timelines are long. You've got little room for maneuver if you make a mistake very early on. Um, and you have to have your testing strategy, you know, we've mentioned that. But what do you think the main considerations for, you know, people who are starting out, what should they be considering looking for the end in mind? So you've, you spent a lot of time at the, on yeah. this at Nova Nordisk, I it imagine. A, it's a very difficult question, actually, uh, and it depends very much what is your main goal. Do you want to move fast into clinic? Then, of course, you can cut some corners and, and that is often what we see that, that you want to move fast and have your clinical proof of concept, which is also fantastic. And But then often if you have, for instance, chosen the wrong cell line or the wrong uh, raw materials or didn't do your uh, qualifications correctly, then you might have to go uh, back and, and change the line or change some of the process steps. And that could be uh, really hitting the timelines for then moving forward. But I think there is no good answer uh, to that question. It also depends on, on of course, your, how long you can look ahead with your financial frame that you are working within, right? So, and, and I think the field also really I'm maturing in this sense that it will be easier and easier to make the right choices because uh, some of the raw materials are mm. becoming more standard. The, the media we're using is becoming more and more available in the right uh, quality <coughs> early on. So I think we'll see that, that it, it will be easier and easier. And, and uh, there's an, a common understanding, I think, also with all the guidelines now and, and all the uh, maturity of the field that this will be... Uh, something that we'll see less and less of. Uh, we'll use the right cell lines from the get-go and so on. So, okay. yeah. And Stefan, you work with a lot of developers. You, you co-develop. Mm -hmm. do you, what's your common guidance to the people you work with? I think it, what, what is really important is to, to try to understand a target product profile as early as possible. And so, Talking to early stage developers, uh, they, they are often more unknowns than knowns. And uh, I, I think what, what, what is helpful is to, to actually work with a partner and, and a partner that asks those, those nasty, annoying questions, uh, because that, that actually helps to focus the conversation uh, towards what you really want to do. And I think that, that yeah, that's the single most important thing. Mm, I would agree. 
Jennifer, anything to add? No, I just, I, I was smiling on the, the target product profile because I think that is something that is very helpful to have mm -hmm. early on. I think, especially for smaller developers where you're trying to run really lean, um, you tend to focus a lot on building out your research organizations in order to do that early discovery and preclinical work. But because of how these products are structured and that the choices that you make will carry over to your eventual commercial product, you do need to have that line of sight into what's required in the CMC space. And so, you know, whether it's engaging a partner who has that experience or if it's building out your own internal capabilities, you do need to have that voice of CM mm. CMC present really early on in order to make those right choices. And then in, we're talking about scalability and getting these products to treat diabetes, you know. So and we have had some breakthrough in scalability, and I know for, you know, at Catapult, we're looking at it. But what do you think the real breakthroughs have been and or the challenges still to come? Stefan. Well, so if, if I look back at the, the, the days that, that I was just staring to the microscope, hoping to find some, some beating cells. <laughs> um, so we, we were actually just doing something and hoping that we were creating the cell types that, that we wanted. And so if you looked at, at basically the input of, of embryonic stem cells, iPSC, to, to target cells, typically the ratio was 100 to 1. Right now we are 1 to, to, to 10 to 100 to 10,000. So I think fundamentally we, we really start to understand what drives those lineage decisions and what are, what are the media compositions, what are the side kinds that, that drive that. So that process understanding, I think, is, is the basis of everything. As a result, it becomes easier to go to industrial scale to use bioreactors instead of cell culture dishes. Uh, and yeah, I think that, that is the most important thing. And do you think, obviously, using bioreactors is fantastic, but some cell types aren't suited to bioreactors. Do you see that as a challenge, or do you see technologies coming down the line? Yeah, so I think the field is not ready to settle on one technology. I was trying to touch upon this during when I talked earlier. So I think the, the interesting thing is you're, you're starting with a cell type that is fundamentally different than the cell type that comes out of the process. And so, so it has different nutritional requirements. Uh, it has different uh, growing patterns. Uh, it, it's the, an iPS cell is an endothelial cell that, that wants to epithelial cell that wants to make junctions. So growing that as single cells is, is, is against the nature of the biology. While if you are starting to go into the blood lineage, you, you obviously have cells that are in suspension. Uh, a cardiomyocyte looks very different than an endothelial cell. Mm -hmm. A neuron is interesting because the moment that it really starts to mature, you get these outgrowths, and, and that becomes more difficult to cryopreserve. So I don't think that the field will settle on one technology. It, it will be a combination. Lots of agreements. Mm. Anything to add? No. OK, and then I, th I think the other really thorny issue that we see is what is appropriate characterization, the initial uh, gentlemen discussed that. Where do you think we're going? Do you, know, do you think we're going to settle on a real understanding of the master cell bank, like yourselves, is sufficient for the regulators? Or do you think there'll always be that concern that there may be a residual cell in the, the drug product that you have to you know, do all your field, field testing on? How did you convince yourselves, because that's what you have to do first before you go to the regulators, that your approach of doing the master cell bank testing was sufficient and then a reduced testing on the drug product. Yeah, so I think it really depends on your process. So what we did was we started with the process in mind before we even thought about the analytical characterization and um, you know, walked through that process to understand what the potential risks were and at what stages. So for instance, with our process very early on, we came to the realization that you know, that cloning a step plays a really important role in our ability to feel comfortable that anything related to genome editing, we have control over that once we take things down to a single cell. So there, I think we're very comfortable relying on the testing at the master cell bank in order to address the question of what risks do we have associated with genome editing. Now, the expansion, you know, you do still have that risk where, you know, we do additional expansion downstream of the master cell bank and you could 
in theory, accumulate a potential variant which may be of a concern. And I think that's where we've got to get additional process understanding. And so we've invested in developing the characterization tools early on in development so that we can gain an understanding of what does our process look like, what kind of risks are introduced, so that by the time we get to that stage where we're looking for a licensure, we have enough information to make an informed choice on what we feel needs to be release um, versus you know we're comfortable that we have a good assessment of the risk involved. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and with Nova Nordisk, do, do you agree, or do you, or because larger companies tend to be slightly more conservative? Yeah, I think I also totally agree. But I think we also, as you say, uh, Jacqueline, we we try to really look ahead and and also yeah maybe be a little bit more cautious of what we are doing um, and and secure that it is really the right thing we are moving forward with right uh, that is very important for us um, and I think there's there's many things one thing is the master cell bank but we also have to look into uh, how the cells are the final drug product characterize that in a, in a good way and, and make sure that you don't have batch to batch variation you have to understand how you deliver the cells that the cells are actually still alive and and uh, can actually do the function in the patients that uh, that you intend to and also if you have for instance multiple injections in uh, of the cell same cell product you have to make sure that each injection is accurate and the same uh, dose is given to all your patients. So there's a lot of control parameters that we still are building, I think, in this space. Um, but sometimes you, you think that it's just to, to give the patients a cell, but you forget about how do you make sure you, you ex give the exact same dose every time. And, and how do you also ensure that the cells are actually engrafting and, and doing and surviving in the patients, right? Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. whole other mm -hmm. uh, aspect. And, and sometimes if you can make sure that more cells survive and engraft, you also can go back and maybe have less of a burden on your manufacturing side, right? Because you might need to manufacture less cells then. So it's kind of a hen and egg situation that, uh, that you have to figure out everything and then go back sometimes and improve and and, and build the whole uh, pipeline um, yeah to be even better next time right it's some it's difficult though sometimes isn't it to have that ability to go back take the time yeah plan yeah. it properly if, if you're yeah. a young company need to get to the clinic quickly it's that's difficult and so so what one thing I think that what we see very often is that that, that there are different perspectives on these things. So it's a very simple, um, a biologist versus a process engineer on how to culture the cell. So the process engineer will say, let's take triple and, and count them and make sure that we do this exactly <laughs> tight. And then the biologist in the room says, no, 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 no. We, we have to do it in clump without enzymes and that's much better for the cell. And so you get a lot of interesting discussions and. I think there, there is no formal answer on it. Uh, so at the end of the day, you, you, you sit together, you d discuss the race, and, and you figure out the path forward. Mm. But I think it's too early to be very definitive on these kind of topics. Sure. And then the d another difference that I observed was you, you both were talking about having one master cell bank, you know, and if you can expand it enough. Once you get into treating initial uh, diabetes, you're never really going to get away with one master cell bank, I don't imagine. So what are your considerations with comparability? You know, where, where do you, obviously you start considering the donor variability, or do you try to use a, cl a different clone from the same donor? You know, what's your considerations? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Uh, I mean, luckily we have very big working cell banks, <laughs> so we have not been in that situation yet. Um, and that's also why I think uh, I would never go for a master cell bank only. I would always go for for big working cell banks. Um, so, but I think there's no good answer to how we show comparability. I think the assays that we're building, uh, uh, potency assays, uh, how to ensure that the cells are actually doing exactly the same. Um, hopefully someday we'll, we'll make sure that you can do comparability studies without having to going all the way back and, and restart your phase one trials, right? 
Uh, but I'm not sure we are there yet. Uh, I think it's, it still takes uh, yeah, somebody to do the first move and, mm. and try it out with the authorities and see how do you actually uh, go about it and, 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 and get it done, because I think we will also need it at some point, uh, because you will face in the future that you would like to uh, use a gene edited cell line. It's the same cell line, but now with the, it's a different clone, right? So how do you consider that, uh, and how do you move that forward? I think that's still open questions. And do you think proven comparability of the bank should be sufficient? You know, if you take your approach where you're saying, we're testing the bank, this is where we are, or do you think one will always need to prove the comparability of the drug product as well? You know, because there's two approaches really, isn't there? In the end, it's the drug product that counts, right? So you have to prove that it does the same to the patient that you intend to in, your, in the first place and make sure it's equally safe. So, um, yeah, I think in my mind, that's the most important place to make sure it's, it's equal. I think it depends, though, on where you're introducing a, a change in the process. So, um, you know, if I take a page from my vaccine days, um, you know, if you're if you're introducing a change kind of early on in the process, um, you may need to kind of focus then on the downstream impacts. Um, so, how does that then translate and impact later stages of the process? If you're making a change later in the process, then you can do a more focused comparability assessment that really gets to the um, impact of those changes later on. Um, I do think that we need to be careful when we think about comparability um, in terms of what can be addressed through analytical comparability mm. versus, um, mm. you know, where do you actually have a new product? Mm. So, you know, if you are if you are introducing new edits, then you're fundamentally making a new product. Mm. Um, so that's not going to be yeah. handled through comparability. That's going to, um, you know, need to go through kind of the more standard drug development process. Mm. Um, I mean, I think that there is opportunity um, if you're talking about product changes and you're still in um, earlier phases uh, under the IND um, where you could introduce like parent-child approach mm -hmm. where you could investigate, um, you know, minor changes to that, to that product. But that's different. It's distinct from an analytical comparability exercise where you're talking fundamentally the same product but a change in the process. Thank you. And just when you mentioned vaccines, I, I thought of Vaccine Master File. And I know when we were talking in advance, you, you brought up the whole idea about a drug master file and the utility of that. Yeah, and Je Jennifer mentioned it earlier. Um, so I, I hope personally that, that the field will go there and, and that, that, uh, that, that master files will, will make regulatory submissions easier. Um, so th there is this this new initiative on the way uh, to to work on, uh, on on platform approaches for for IPSC that that in, in a way goes hand in hand with master files. So uh, for example, you can think about the reprogramming uh, step, the the methodologies. It, it it makes it a lot easier if if a therapeutic developer can cross reference uh, such a master file. We we probably can think about a master file for for. For example, an IPSC uh, differentiating towards an HSC, mm -hmm. uh, certain parts of the gene editing process, and so the, the hope is that 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 that, that will allow uh, therapeutic developers to make things easier, especially in that situation where where we we might be looking at a cascade of products with, with different gene edits. So a quick regulatory process mm -hmm. would be very useful to 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 be as flexible as possible developing the right product. Do you think that's likely in the short term? I'm positive. I think we're going in that direction. So I think that there is a mechanism in the US and I think then with the IMPDQ that's um, you know coming up in the, the EU that um, I think that there's increasing um, acceptance of that approach. So um, I think that that's something that you know, we would look forward to, um, you know, to, to looking at, especially when you've got common upstream uh, materials, whether that's an IPSC bank or even a partially engineered bank that might be common to two products, uh, being able to uh, utilize those mechanisms to streamline um, some of the, the regulatory aspects uh, would be very helpful. 
Although I suppose one, one comment that I would make is in the EU, the QP always has to know the full manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. So I suppose the, drug, the master file would have to be released to the QP under confidentiality or whatever, um, because regulators tend not to accept opening a drug master file for, or a master file. Um, any other questions? We've got a couple of minutes left. Can I ask one real quick from here? Do you talk about potency assays? We all struggle with that. What's the state of <laughs> So for that was yeah. potency assays, where are we? <laughs> yeah, I think that's something, as you say, the field is struggling with, but uh, also will be extremely valuable to develop, right? And I think, uh, yeah, methods like AI and stuff like that is something that you can maybe use to build those potency assays. And I think it's, there's a necessity to go that way uh, because you can't do a, an in vivo study on all, all your batches, right? So. So I think that is certainly something there's a huge need for in the field. So um, yeah, I can only acknowledge that as well, yeah. Yeah, I think that there is an opportunity to do something a little bit more nuanced there, and I would agree. You know, as we, um, you know, start to see kind of the evolution of, of um, AI and, and other tools, you know, pairing that with, um, you know, a multi-parametric approach, um, maybe we might not be able to rely on just a single potency assay, um, but it might be kind of a number of different factors that we'll have to evaluate in order to really be predictive of performance. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, we really got the the potential to to develop and drive that, that different approach compared to what might be sufficient in um, other modalities. I think this, the, what, what is really important is that the, the products that are in the clinic or moving towards the clinic, they, they all have a well characterized mechanism of action. And so that, that makes the development of good potency assays obviously easier. And, and what, what is nice about this field is that, that that mechanism of action is typically a little bit clearer than what you have seen with previous generations of cell therapies. Okay, well, we're actually bang on time now, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wind it up and thank you very much for, for your talks and taking part in the panel. Please thank you.